Hello, I'm Dr. Rajiv Agarwal, a professor of medicine at Indiana University School of Medicine and staff physician at the VA Medical Center at Indianapolis, Indiana. I thank Drs. Quagan, Karamanji, and Cruz and the members of the program committee for giving us the opportunity to present the results of a randomized controlled trial for thalidone in advanced chronic kidney disease, CLIC. 11% of the world's population has chronic kidney disease. Few patients who reach stage 4 CKD dread the specter of dialysis, yet these people are often excluded from randomized trials. Small non-randomized interventional studies found that the treatment with thiazide diuretics was effective in reducing blood pressure. Small randomized trials in patients with CKD also found efficacy. The largest had 23 patients. However, it is common belief that thiazides are ineffective for treating hypertension and advanced CKD, and clinical guidelines prefer loop diuretic once GFR falls to less than 30. Chlorothaladone was approved by the FDA in 1960 for the treatment of hypertension. In 2014, we reported a pilot study of 14 patients with moderate to advanced CKD and found that 24-hour systolic blood pressure can be improved by 10.5 millimeters mercury over 12 weeks with a starting dose of 25 milligrams chlorothaladone. Encouraged by these preliminary data, we designed a randomized controlled trial. The hypothesis we tested was that among patients with advanced CKD, chlorothaladone will result in improved 24-hour ambulatory blood pressure and albuminuria, or 12 weeks, and it will do so by shrinking the extracellular fluid volume. We included patients with stage 4 CKD who had poorly controlled hypertension as diagnosed by 24-hour ambulatory blood pressure monitoring. They all had to be treated with an ACE or an ARB or a beta blocker. After informed consent, we observed patients for three weeks. There was a one-week screening phase and a two-week run-in phase. During the screening phase, we asked patients to measure their blood pressure twice daily at home. During the two-week run-in phase, we prescribed antihypertensive medication such that each patient received a preferred medication for each of the five major medication classes. We also prescribed a placebo once daily. When they returned, we performed an ambulatory blood pressure monitoring for 24 hours. If they met inclusion-exclusion criteria, they were randomized to either chlorothaladone or placebo. Randomization was stratified by loop diuretic use. In the first four weeks, each patient received either 12 and a half milligrams chlorothaladone or placebo. We doubled the dose of the study drug every four weeks based on home blood pressure to a maximum of 50 milligrams chlorothaladone daily. The last visit for randomized treatment was 12 weeks, at which time ambulatory blood pressure monitoring was performed. The study medication was discontinued, the patient returned two weeks later, and additional consent was obtained for observational annual follow-up for subsequent three years. At each one of the clinic visits, at randomization and subsequently, we obtained USCR, serum chemistries, and EGFR. We also measured markers of effective arterial blood volume, lemon, aldosterone, and anti-proBNP, and total body volume using total body plethysmography. The primary outcome was the adjusted change from baseline to 12 weeks in systolic ambulatory blood pressure in the chlorothaladone group compared to placebo. Our study was powered to detect a 6 millimeter difference between groups in systolic ambulatory blood pressure after accounting for up to 20% dropout. Over four and a half years, we screened 2849 patients from BA, Eskenazi, and Indiana University Hospitals, all in Indianapolis. More than half met inclusion-exclusion criteria. Of these, a third agreed to come for the informed consent process, and of these, 80% signed the informed consent. 40% of those who consented randomized. 79 received placebo, 81 chlorothaladone. 92% of those receiving placebo and 83% of those receiving chlorothaladone provided a final ambulatory blood pressure. Therefore, 88% of those who participated in the trial had a valuable 24-hour ambulatory blood pressure data. Average age was 66.5 years, 22% were women, 58% white, 40% black, and 1% each Asian and Hispanic. At baseline, 76% had diabetes, comorbidities were high. 
EGFR averaged 23.2 mL per minute. 67% of the patients had macroalbuminuria at baseline. The distribution of USCR was balanced between groups. After five minutes of seated rest without an observer in the room, automated oscillometric clinic blood pressure averaged 140 over 69 millimeters mercury. Patients were on 3.4 antihypertensive medications, 60% were on loop diuretics, and 99% were on ACE, ARB, or beta blocker. Clinic systolic blood pressure, similar at baseline, over a 12-week randomized phase, blood pressure remained stable with placebo, but dropped with chlorpalidone. At four weeks, the between-group difference was 11.9, and at 12 weeks, it was 15.1. Once the drug was stopped, blood pressure increased in chlorpalidone group, but even after two weeks of no chlorpalidone, blood pressure in chlorpalidone was 12.3 millimeters lower compared to placebo. At four weeks, chlorpalidone group had lost 1.5 kilo weight, at 12 weeks, 2.1 kilograms. After two weeks of being off the study drug, chlorpalidone group still had 1.4 kilo lower weight compared to placebo. And now the main results of the trial. At baseline, 24-hour ambulatory systolic blood pressure was similar between groups. The adjusted drop from baseline at 12 weeks was 0.5 millimeters in the placebo group and 11 millimeters in the chlorothalidone group. Between group difference was 10.5 millimeters mercury with a p-value of less than 1 in 10,000. Ambulatory systolic blood pressure was similarly reduced during the wake and sleep states. Dipping status was therefore not altered by chlorpalidone. 24-hour ambulatory diastolic blood pressure was reduced by 3.9 millimeters mercury. Urine albumin to urine creatinine ratio was similar at baseline. Over the 12-week randomized phase, USCR was stable with placebo. However, it dropped with chlorpalidone. With chlorpalidone at four weeks, USCR was 36% lower, and at 12 weeks, 50% lower. Once the drug was stopped, USCR increased in chlorothalidone group, but even after two weeks of stopping chlorothalidone, USCR in the chlorothalidone was still 34% lower. Anti-proBNP dropped with chlorothalidone. As expected, renin increased with chlorothalidone, and plasma aldosterone increased with chlorothalidone. Adverse effects and serious adverse events were balanced between groups. Four in chlorothalidone and one in placebo stopped study drug permanently. Chlorothalidone was associated with more hypokalemia, hyponatremia, hypomagnesemia, hyperglycemia, hyperuricemia, but less hyperkalemia. Symptomatic orthostatic hypertension, dizziness, and syncope were also more common with chlorothalidone. At least a 25% increase in serum creatinine concentration from baseline was seen in 13% in placebo and 45% in chlorothalidone group. The incidence of this transient increase in serum creatinine concentration was strongly influenced by loop diuretic use, and those on loop diuretic chlorothalidone was much more likely to cause this increment. Although EGFR is lower in chlorothalidone group after stopping the drug, it returned to baseline. We next evaluated the long-term risk of kidney failure or death. There were 29 events in the placebo group and 20 in the chlorothalidone group. The hazard ratio, 0.63, favored chlorothalidone. In conclusion, in stage 4 CKD, chlorothalidone effectively reduces systolic blood pressure by about 10 millimeters mercury within 4 weeks, which persists at 12 weeks. Reduction in USCR by 50% suggests kidney protection. The blood pressure and volume contraction effects of chlorothalidone are long-acting. Changes in EGFR are often seen more likely to occur among patients on loop diuretics, but do not appear to harm kidney function in the long term. Blood pressure, electrolytes, and kidney function should closely be monitored when using chlorothalidone. I express my gratitude to the funding agencies, especially NHLDI, to my team who made the research possible, to the Data Safety Monitoring Board for their oversight, and to each of the 160 patients and their families. It is a great day for these patients because their efforts were rewarded by the editors who have recognized chlorothalidone as a potential low-cost solution for the treatment of hypertension and published these findings in the New England Journal of Medicine. The full results can be obtained at the website.
Thank you for your attention.